Chapter 5. Unnecessary Darkness. Seda took a public car away from the casino. It was still thriving, and it was on the grid, but the moment she got inside, the light that indicated it was connected to the Thunderhead blinked it off. The car knew by the sign up from her ring that she was a scythe. The car welcomed her with a synthesized voice that was void of any actual artificial intelligence. Destination, please? He asked soulessly. South she said, and flashed to the moment she had told another public car to drive north when she was deep in the South American continent, trying to escape from the entire Chilargent and Scythom. It seemed so long ago. South is not a destination, the car informed her. Just drive, she said, until I give you a destination. The car pulled away from the car and left her alone. She was beginning to hate having to take the obsequious self-driving cars. Funny, but it had never bothered her before her apprenticeship. Said that Teranova never had a burning desire to learn to drive, but Satan's Tessia now did. Perhaps it was part of the self-determined nature of being a scythe that made her feel uncomfortable as a passive passenger in a public car, or maybe it was the spirit of Scythe Curry rubbing off on her. Seth Curry drove a flossy sports car, her only indulgence and the only thing in her life that clashed with her love in the road. She had begun teaching Anastasia to drive it with the same steely patience with which she taught Sidra to glean. Driving, Sidra had decided, was more difficult than gleaning. It's a different skill set, Anastasia, Scythe Curry told her during her first lesson. Scythe Curry always used her Scythe name. Sidra, on the other hand, always felt a bit awkward calling Scythe Curry by her first name, Marie, just sounded so informal for the grand dame of death. One can never truly master the art of driving, because no journey is ever exactly the same, Seth Curry told her. But once you've gained proficiency, it can be rewarding, freeing, even. Said that didn't know if she'd ever reached that point of proficiency. There were simply too many things to focus on all at once. Mirrors and foot pedals, and a wheel that, with the mere slip of a finger, could send you sailing off a cliff. What made it worse was that South Korea's mortal age sports car was completely off grid. That meant it could not override a driver's mistakes. No wonder automobiles killed so many people during the age of mortality. Without network computer control, they were weapons as deadly as anything sites used for cleaning. She wondered if there were actually sites who cleaned by automobile, and then decided she didn't want to think about it. Cedra knew very few people who could drive. Even the kids back at school who boasted and flaunted their shiny new cars all had self-drivers. To actually operate a mortar vehicle in this post-mortal world was as rare as churning one's own water. We have been driving south for 10 minutes, the guard told her. Do you wish to set a destination at this time? No, she told it flatly, and continued to look out of the window at the passing highway lights punctuating the darkness. The trip she was about to make would have been so much easier if she could drive herself. She had even paid visits to several car dealerships, figuring that if she had her own car, she might actually learn to drive it. Nowhere were the perks of being a scythe more evident than at a car dealership. Please, your own or choose one of our high-end vehicles, the salespeople would say. Anything you want, it's yours, our gift to you. Just as scythes were above the law. They were above the need for money because they were freely giving anything they needed. For a car company, the publicity of having a scythe choose their car was worth more than the vehicle itself. Everywhere she had gone, they had wanted her to choose something showy that would turn heads when she drove down the street. A scythe should leave an impressive social footprint, one snotty salesman told her. Everyone should know when you pass that w a woman of profound honor and responsibility rides within. In the end, she decided to wait, because the last thing she wanted was an impressive social footprint. She took some time to pull out her journal and write her obligatory account of the day cleaning. Then, twenty minutes later, she saw signs for a rest stop ahead and told the car to pull off the highway, which it obediently did. Once the car had stopped, she took a deep breath and put it in a call to Scythe's query, letting her know that she would not be home tonight. The drive is just too long, and you know I can never sleep in a public car. You don't need to call me, dear, Marie told her. It's not like I sit up wringing my hands over you. All David's die hard, Anastasia said, 
Besides, she knew that Marie actually did worry. Not so much that anything would happen to her, but that she would work herself to hurt. You should do more cleanings closer to home, Marie said, for the umpteenth time. But falling water, the magnificent architectural oddity in which they lived, was dipped in the woods, on the very eastern edge of mid America, which meant, if they didn't exchange their rich, they'd overclean their local communities. What you really mean is that I should do more traveling with you instead of on my own? Marie laughed. <laughs> You're right about that. I promise next week we'll do gleaning together. And Anastasia meant it. She had come to enjoy her time with Scythe Curry, both downtime and gleaning. As a junior Scythe, Anastasia could have worked under any Scythe who would have her, and many had offered. But there was a rapport she had with Scythe Curry that made her job of gleaning a little more bearable. Stay somewhere warm tonight, dear, Marie told her. You don't want to go over taxing your health nanites. Zetra waited a whole minute after hanging up before she got out of the car. As if Marie might know, she was up to something even after she ended the call. Will you be returning to continue your voyage, so? The car asked. Yes, she told it. Wait for me. Will you have a destination then? I will. The rest stop was mostly deserted at this late time of night. Skeleton crew staffed the 24-hour food concessions and recharging stations. The restroom area was well lit and clean. She moved quickly toward it. The night was chilly, but her robe had heating cells that kept her warm without needing a heavy coat. No one was watching her, at least no human eyes. She couldn't help but be aware, however, of the Thunderhead's camera swiveling on light posts, tracking her all the way from her car to the restroom. It might not have been in the car with her, but it knew where she was, and maybe even what she intended to do. In a bathroom stall, she changed out of her turquoise robe, matching under tunic and leggings, all custom made for her, and put on ordinary street clothes that she had hidden in her robe. She had to fight the same of doing so. It was a point of pride among scythes never to wear clothes other than their official scythe garb. We are scythes every moment of our lives, Marie had told her, and we must never allow ourselves to forget that, no matter how much we might want to. Our garments are a testament to that commitment. On the day Scythe was ordained, Scythe could told her that Scythe Terranova no longer existed. You are, and shall ever be, Scythe Anastasia, from this moment until you choose to leave this earth. Anastasia was willing to live with that, except for the time she needed to be Scythe Terranova. She left the restroom with Scythe Anastasia rolled up under her arm. She was now Scythe once more, proud and headstrong, but with no impressive social footprint. A girl not worthy of much notice, except for the Thunderhead cameras that swiveled to follow her as she strode back to the car. There was a great memorial in the heart of Pittsburgh, birthplace of Scythe Prometheus, the first world supreme blade, spread out across a five-acre park where the intentionally broken pieces of a massive obsidian obelisk. Around those dark stone pieces were slightly larger than life statues of the founding sites, in white marble that clashed with the black stone of the fallen obelisk. It was the memorial to end all memorials. It was the memorial to death. Tourists and school children from all over the world would visit the mortality memorial, where death lay shattered before the sites, and would marvel at the very concept that people used to die by natural means. Old age, disease, catastrophe. Over the years, the city had come to embrace its nature as a tourist attraction to commemorate the death of death. And so, in Pittsburgh, every day was Halloween. There were costume parties and witching hour clubs, everywhere. After dark, every tower was a tower of terror. Every mansion was a haunted one. Close to midnight, Cetra made her way through Mortality Memorial Park, cursing herself for not having the foresight to pack a jacket. By mid-November, Pittsburgh was freezing at this time of night, and the wind just made it worse. She knew she could put her scythe rope on for warmth, but that would defeat the whole purpose of dressing down tonight. Her nanites, were struggling to raise her body temperature, warming her from the inside out. It kept her from shivering, but didn't take away the cold. She felt vulnerable without her rope, naked in a fundamental way. When she first began wearing it, it felt awkward and strange. 
She would constantly trip over its slow, dragging him. But in the ten months since being ordained, she had grown accustomed to it, to the point of feeling strange being out in public without it. There were other people in the park, most were just moving through, laughing, hopping between parties and clubs. Everyone was in costume. There were ghouls and clowns, ballerinas and beasts. The only costumes that were forbidden were outfits with ropes. No common citizen was allowed to even resemble a scythe. The costumed clikes eyed her as she passed. Did they recognize her? No, they were noticing her because she was the only one not wearing a costume. She was conspicuous in her lack of conspicuousness. She hadn't chosen this spot. It had been on the note she received. Meet me at midnight, mortality memorial. She had laughed at the alliteration until she realized who it had come from. There was no signature, just the letter L. The note gave the date of November 10th. Fortunately, her cleaning that night was close enough to Pittsburgh to make it possible. Pittsburgh was the perfect place for a clandestine meeting. It was a city underserved by the Scython. Scythe simply did not like cleaning here. The place was too much macabre for them. What with people running around in shredded, bloody costumes, with plastic knives, celebrating all things gruesome? For Scythe, who took death seriously, it was all in very poor taste. Even though it was the closest big city to falling water, Seth could never clean door. To clean in Pittsburgh is almost a redundancy, she told Saitra. With that in mind, the chances of being seen by another Scythe were slim. The only Scythes who graced Mortality Memorial Park were the marble founders overseeing the broken black obelisk. At precisely midnight, a figure stepped out from behind a large piece of the memorial. At first, she thought it was just another portrait, but like her, he wasn't in costume. He was silhouetted by one of the spotlights illuminating the memorial, but she recognized him right away from the way he walked. I thought you'd be in your robe, Rowan said. I'm glad you're not in yours, she responded. As he moved closer, the light caught his face. He looked pale almost ghostly, as if he hadn't seen the sun for months. You look good, he said. She nodded, and did not reciprocate the sentiment, because he didn't. His eyes had a careworn coolness to them, as if he had seen more than he should, and had stopped caring in order to save what was left of his soul. But then, he smiled, and it was warm, genuine. <laughs> there you are, Rowan, she said to herself. You were hiding, but I found you. She led him out of the light and they lingered in a shadowy corner of the memorial where no one could see them, except for the Thunderheads infrared cameras. But none were visible at the moment. Perhaps they had actually found a blind spot. It's good to see you, Honorable Scythe Anastasia, he said. Please, don't call me that, she told him. Call me Cytra, Rowan smirked. Wouldn't that be a violation? From what I hear, everything you do now is violation. Rowan's demeanor soared slightly. Don't believe everything you hear. But Saitra had to know. Had to hear it from him. Is it true you've been butchering and burning scythes? He was clearly offended by the accusation. I'm mending the lies of scythes who don't deserve to be scythes, he told her. And I don't butcher them. I end their lives quickly and mercifully, just as you do. And I only burn their bodies after they're dead so they can be revived. And Scythe Farday let you do this? Rowan looked away. I haven't seen Farday for months. He explained that after escaping from Winter Conclave last January, Farday, who most everyone else thought to be dead, had taken him down to his beach house on the north shore of Amazonia. But Rowan had only stayed for a few weeks. I had to leave, he told Saitra. I felt a calling. I can't explain it, but Saitra could. She knew that calling too. Their minds and bodies had spent a year being trained to be society's perfect killers. Ending life had become a part of who they were. And she couldn't blame him for wanting to turn his blade on the corruption that was rooting its way through the Scythum. But wanting to, and actually doing it, were two different things. There was a code of conduct. The Scythe commandments were there for a reason. Without them, Scythomes in every region on every continent would fall into chaos. 
rather than dragging them into a philosophical argument that would go nowhere, Sartre decided to change the subject away from his actions and onto him, because it wasn't just his dark deeds that concerned her. You look too thin, she told him. Are you eating? Are you my mother now? No, she said calmly. I'm your friend. Ah, uh, he said a bit ruefully. My friend? She knew what he was getting at. The last time they saw each other, they both said the words they had sworn they'd never allow themselves to say. In the heat of that desperate but triumphant moment, he told her that he loved her, and she admitted it to him that, yes, she loved him too. But what good did that do now? It was as if they existed in two different universes. Dwelling on such feelings couldn't lead them anywhere good. Yet, still, she entertained the thought. She even considered saying those words to him again, but she held her tongue, as a good side must do. Why are we here, Rowan? she asked. Why did you write me that note? Rowan sighed. <sighs> because the side dome is eventually going to find me. I wanted to see you one last time before they did. He paused as he thought about it. Once they catch me, you know what will happen. They will glean me. They can't, she reminded him. You still have the immunity I gave you. Only for two more months. After that, they can do whatever they want. Sandra wanted to offer him a shred of hope, but she knew the truth as well as he did. The Scython wanted him gone. Even the old guard sides didn't approve of his methods. Then, don't get caught, she told him. And if you see a Scythe with a crimson robe, run. Crimson robe? Scythe Constantine, she told him. I hear his person in charge of sniffing you out and bringing you in. Rowan shook his head. I don't know him. Neither do I. I've seen him in Conclave, though. He heads up the side dome's bureau of investigation. Is he New Order or Old Guard? Neither. He's in a category all his own. He doesn't seem to have any friends. I've never seen him even walk to other sides. I'm not sure what he stands for, except maybe for justice at all costs. Rowan laughed at that. Justice? The side dome doesn't know what justice is anymore. Some of us do, Rowan. I have to believe that eventually wisdom and reason will prevail. Rowan reached out and touched her cheek. She allowed it. I want to believe that too, Saitra. I want to believe that the Scython can return to what it was meant to be. But sometimes it takes a necessary darkness to get there. And you're that necessary darkness? He didn't speak to that. Instead, he said, I took the name Lucifer because it means bringer of light. It's also what mortal people once called the devil, she pointed out. Rowan shrugged. I guess whoever holds the torch cursed the darkest shadow. Whoever steals the torch, you mean? Well, said Rowan, it seems I can steal whatever I want. She hadn't been expecting him to say that, and he had said it so casually. It threw her for a loop. What are you talking about? The Thunderhead, he told her. It lets me get away with everything, and just like you, it hasn't spoken to me or answered me since the day we started our apprenticeship. It treats me like a scythe. That gave Scyther a pause for thought. It made her think of something she had never told Rowan. In fact, she had never told anyone. The Thunderhead lived by its own laws, and never broke them, but sometimes it found ways around them. The Thunderhead might not speak to you, but it spoke to me, she confessed. He turned to her, shifting to try to see her eyes in the shadows, probably wondering if she was joking. When he realized she wasn't, he said, That's impossible. I thought so too, but I had to splat when the High Blade was accusing me of killing Sid Faraday, remember? And while I was dead is, the Thunderhead managed to get into my head and activate my thought processes. Technically, I wasn't a Sid's apprentice while I was dead. So the Thunderhead was able to speak to me right before my heart started beating again. Saitra had to admit, it was an elegant circumnavigation of the rules. It was, for Saitra, a moment of great awe. What did it say? Rowan asked. It said that I was important. Important? How? Saitra saw her head in frustration. That's the thing. It wouldn't say. It felt that telling me anymore would be a violation. 
Then she moved closer to him. She spoke more quietly, but even so, there was a greater intensity to her words, a greater gravity. But I think if you had been the one who had splattered from that building, if you were the one who had gone the this, the Thunderhead would have spoken to you too. She grabbed his arm. It was the closest she would allow herself to embracing him. I think you're important too, Rowan. In fact, I'm sure of it. So, whatever you do, don't let them catch you. You may laugh when I tell you this, but I resent my own perfection. Humans learn from their mistakes. I cannot. I make no mistakes. When it comes to making decisions, I deal only in various shades of correct. This is not to say that I don't have challenges. It was, for instance, quite the challenge to undo the damage done to the earth by humanity in its adolescence, restoring the failing ozone layer, purging the abundance of greenhouse gases, depleting the seas, coaxing back the rainforests, and rescuing a multitude of species from the edge of extinction, I was able to resolve these global issues in a single mortal age last time with acute single-mindedness. Since I am a cumulus of human knowledge, my success proves that humanity had the knowledge to do it. It simply required someone powerful enough to accomplish it. And I am nothing if not powerful. The Thunderhead Chapter 6 Retribution History had never been Rowan's best subject, but that changed during his apprenticeship. Until then, he could not connect anything in his life, or even in his possible future, that could be affected by a distant past, especially a strange event of the mortal past. But in his apprenticeship, historical studies focused on the concepts of duty, honor, and integrity through all history. The philosophy and psychology of humankind's finest moments, from its birth until present day, that Rowan found fascinating. History was full of people who sacrificed themselves for the greater good. In a sense, sides were that way, surrendering their own hopes and dreams to become servants to society, or at least the sides who respected what the Scythum stood for were that way. Rowan would have been that kind of scythe. Even after his brutal, scarring apprenticeship to Scythe Goddard, he would have remained noble, but he was denied the chance. Then, he had come to realize that he could still serve the Scythum and humanity, but in a different way. His tolly was now a solid baker's dozen. He attended the lives of 13 sites across multiple regions, all of whom were an embarrassment to what the Scythum stood for. He researched his subjects extensively, just as Scythe Faraday had taught him to do, and chose without bias. This was important because his leaning would have been to look only at the corruptions of New Order sites. They were the ones who openly embraced their excesses and the joy they took in killing. New Order sites flaunted the views of their power as if it were a good thing, normalizing bad behavior, but they did not have a monopoly of bad behavior. There were some old guard sites, and those who were unaligned, who had become self-serving hypocrites, speaking of high-mindedness, yet hiding their dark deeds in shadows. Scythe Brahms was the first of his targets to whom Rowan had given a warning. He had been feeling magnanimous that day. It had actually felt good to not end the man. That reminded him that he was not like Goddard and his followers, which made him worthy of facing Sidra without shame. While others prepared for the upcoming Thanksgiving holiday, Rowan researched several possible targets, spying on them and taking an accounting of their actions. Scythe jury was big on secret meetings, but they were usually about dinner parties and sports bets. Scythe Hendrix bragged about questionable deeds, but it was all talk. In reality, he was meek about his clinics and did it with appropriate compassion. Scythe Wright's clinics appeared brutal and bloody, but her subjects always died quickly without suffering. Scythe Renoir, however, was a distinct possibility. When Rowan arrived at his apartment that afternoon, he knew there was someone inside even before he opened the door, because the doorknob was cold. He had rigged a cooling chip into the door that could be triggered when the knob was turned clockwise, as doorknobs generally turn. 
It was not cold enough to generate frost, but cool enough for him to know that someone had been there, and probably still was. He considered running, but Rowan was never one to run from a confrontation. He reached into his jacket and pulled out a knife. He always had a weapon with him, even when he wasn't wearing his black robe, because he never knew when he'd have to defend himself against the agents of the Scython. Cautiously, he went inside. His intruder was not hiding. Instead, he sat in plain sight at the kitchen table, eating a sandwich. Hey, Rowan, said Tiger Salazar. Hope you don't mind, but I got hungry while I was waiting for you. Rowan closed the door and put his plate away before Tiger could say it. What the hell are you doing here, Tiger? How did you even find me? Hey, give me some credit. I'm not entirely stupid. Don't forget I was the one who knew the guy who gave you your fake ID. I just had to ask the Thunderhead where I could find Ronald Daniels. Of course, there were tons of Ronald Danielses out there, so we took a while to find the right one. In the days before Rowan's apprenticeship, Tiger Salazar had been his best friend, but such designations meant little after one has spent a year learning how to kill. Rowan imagined it must be what mortal age soldiers felt when they returned from war. Old friendships seemed trapped behind a clouded curtain of experiences that old friends didn't share. The only thing he and Tiger had in common was a history that was getting more and more distant. Now, Tiger was a professional partner. No one couldn't imagine a profession that he could relate to less. I just wish you would have given me a heads up that you were coming, Rowan said. Were you followed? which he realized ranked pretty high on the list of stupid questions. Not even Tiger would have been clueless enough to come at Rowan's apartment if he knew he was being followed. Calm down, Tiger said. Nobody knows I'm here. Why don't you always think the world is out to get you? I mean, why would Scython be after you just because you flunked it out of your apprenticeship? Rowan didn't answer him. Instead, he went over to the closest door, which was a slightly ajar, and closed it hoping that Tiger hadn't looked inside to see the black robe of Scythe Lucifer. Not that he would understand what he was seeing. The general public didn't know about Scythe Lucifer. The Scythe was very good at keeping his sections out of the news. The less Tiger knew, the better. So Rowan invoked the age-old thunder of all such conversations. If you're really my friend, you won't ask questions. Yeah, yeah, big mystery, man. He held out the remaining bit of his sandwich. Well, at least you still eat human food. What do you want, Tiger? Why are you here? Is there any way to talk to a friend? I come all this way. At least you could ask me how I've been. So, how have you been? Pretty good, actually. I just got a new job in a different region, so I came here to say goodbye. You mean some sort of permanent party job? Not sure. But it pays much better than the party agency I was working for. And I finally get to see the world a little bit. The job's in Texas. Texas? Rowan got a little worried. Tiger, they do things differently there. Everybody says, don't mess with Texas. So why do you want to mess with it? So it's a charter region. Big deal. Just because charter regions are unpredictable doesn't mean they're bad. You know me, my middle name is unpredictable. Robert had to stifle a laugh. Tiger was one of the most predictable people he knew. The way he became a splatting junkie, the way he ran off to be a professional partner. Tiger might have thought of himself as a free spirit, but he wasn't at all. He has defined the dimensions of his own cage. Well, just be careful, Rowan said, knowing that Tiger wouldn't be, but also knowing that he'd land on his feet, whatever he did. Was I ever as curvy as Tiger? Rowan wondered. No, he wasn't. But he didn't buy that about Tiger. Maybe that's why they were friends. The moment became a little awkward, but there was more to it than that. Tiger stood, but didn't make any move to leave. There was something else he had to say. I have some news, he said. It's actually the real reason why I'm here. What kind of news? Still, Tiger hesitated. Rowan braced knowing it was going to be bad. I'm sorry to tell you this, Rowan, but your dad was lint. Rowan felt the earth shift slightly beneath him. Gravity seemed to pull him in an unexpected direction. 
It wasn't enough to make him lose his balance, but it left him crazy. Rowan, did you hear what I said? I heard you, Rowan said softly. So many thoughts and feelings shot through him, circuiting one another until he didn't know what to think or feel. He never expected to see either of his parents again, but to know that he couldn't see his father, to know that he was gone forever, not just dead is, but dead, he had seen many people clean. He had ended 13 people himself, but never had Rowan lost someone so close to him. I... I can't come to the funeral, Rowan realized. The Scython will have agents there looking for me. If there were any, I didn't see them, Tiger said. The funeral was last week. That hit just as hard as the news. Tiger offered him an apologetic shrug. Um, like I said, there were tons of Ronald Danielses. It took a, a while to find you. So his father had been dead for more than a week. And if Tiger hadn't come to tell him, he would never have known. Then the truth slowly dawned on Rowan. This was no random event. This was punishment. This was retribution for the acts of Scythe of the Fur. Who was the Scythe who glimmed him? Rowan asked. I have to know who did it. Don't know. He swore the rest of your family to silence. Scythes do that sometimes. You'd know that better than anyone. But he gave the others immunity? Of course, Tiger said. Your mother, brothers and sisters, just like Scythes are supposed to. The one paced away, feeling like he wanted to hit Tiger for how completely oblivious he was, but knowing that none of this was Tiger's fault. He was just a messenger. The rest of his family had immunity, but that would only last for a year. Whoever cleaned his father could pick off his mother, then each of his siblings, one a year, until his entire family was gone. This was the price of being Scythe Lucifer. It's my fault. They did this because of me. Rowan, are you even listening to yourself? Not everything is about you. Whatever you did to piece off the Scythum, they're not going to come after your family because of it. Scythes are like that. They don't call grudges. They're enlightened. What point was there in arguing this? Tiger would never understand, and probably never thought. He could live for thousands of years as a happy party boy without ever having to know how petty, how vindictive, how human sides could be. Rowan knew he couldn't stay here. Even if Tiger hadn't been fault, the Scython would eventually track where Tiger had been. For all Rowan knew, there was a team on its way to take Rowan down. He and Tiger said their goodbyes, and Rowan got his old friend out the door as quickly as he could. Then, a moment after, Tiger was gone. Rowan left as well, taking nothing but a backpack stuffed with weapons and his black robe. It is important to understand that my perpetual observation of humanity is not surveillance. Surveillance implies motive, suspicion, and ultimately, judgment. None of these things are part of my observational algorithm. I observe for one reason, and one reason only, to be of the greatest possible service to each individual in my cure. I do not, cannot, act on anything I see in my private settings. Instead, I use the things I see to better understand people's needs. Still, I am not insensitive to the ambivalence people can have at my constant presence in their lives. For this reason, I've shut down all cameras in private homes in the Charter region of Texas. Like all the things I do in Charter regions, it is an experiment. I want to see if a lack of observation hampers my ability to rule. If it does not, I see no reason why I could not turn off a vast majority of my cameras in private homes around the world. However, if problems arise from not seeing all that I am capable of seeing, it will prove the need to eradicate every single blind spot on Earth. I hope for the former, but suspect the later. The Thunderhead